Hey guys, so last videos. So far you've learned how to utterly memorize the flashcards completely and we taught you the ear then grammar prediction technique on all the grammar questions in SAT and ACT grammar. So 60% of the questions are grammar, 40% are rhetoric and I'm going to start to show you how to predict on uh, certain types of rhetoric questions here. Um, a few different types of rhetoric questions, but first let's review why do we predict our answers on questions? Again, it puts us in, in an anticipatory state of mind. When you're anticipating what's coming, you just get smarter. You, when you anticipate what the other football team is going to do in the game and you come up with a game plan to handle it, you just make smarter decisions in the game. Uh, no general is, is going to go into war or battle without anticipating what the other side will do. And because they've been anticipating, even if the other side does something different than what they're anticipating, the sheer act of anticipating what's coming makes you smarter. And it's the same thing with looking at the answers on these tests. When you cover the answers and come up with a prediction as to what the right answer should be, you're just smarter when you look at the answers. The right answer is a way of popping out. You don't even notice the wrong answers. When you don't predict, you get lured into these little subtle traps in the wrong answers that are meant to be tempting. And you just are more likely to fall for it and choose wrong answers. Um, and I've just seen it with hundreds of students that if, if maybe they're not buying my spiel at first about the importance of predicting, and then when they finally do start predicting, they get rid of just the few remaining errors uh, that they were having. Um, so I'm going to talk about predicting on a certain type of rhetoric question. Rhetoric, by the way, are the questions about how the writer writes the story and how should they best write the story. The type of rhetoric question we're going to look at is called a rhetoric underline the key phrase question. And number two here is an exact example. So why are these called rhetoric underline the key phrase questions? Because in order to predict on them, you underline the key phrase which says exactly what the right answer must do. So as we look at question two here, we're going to underline the part of the question that says exactly what the right answer must do. Actually, before that, first we're going to cover the answers. And as you take the test, you do that with your hand. Second step is underline the key phrase in the question that tells you exactly what the right answer must do. And by doing that, you're anticipating what the right answer must do. The right answer must do the key phrase in the question. Let's see what I mean. So it says, which one provides a detail that best leads into the description that follows in this paragraph? So whichever answer we go for, it's going it to better provide a detail it's going to lead into the description that follows in this paragraph. Okay. Um, so that's basically steps one and two for predicting on these rhetoric underline the key phrase questions. One, cover the answers. Two, underline the key phrase in the question. This is exactly what the right answer must do. Now, some of these rhetoric underline the key phrase questions reference a part of the passage. This one, for example, references the description that follows in this paragraph. If the question mentions a part of the passage, your job, your third step in the prediction, after covering the answers and underlining the key phrase, is to summarize that part of the passage for yourself. So this question actually does that. Uh, it mentions part of the passage, leads into the description that follows in this paragraph. So we're going to go summarize the description that follows in this paragraph. So let's go read it. All right, here's a paragraph. I soon came to love the silence of the photo darkroom, illuminated only by its dim red light. Something about that isolation and darkness seemed mysterious. I took a negative from the collection and enclosed it in the glass of the enlarger. An enlarger is a magnifying device used in printing photographs. I exposed the paper with a flash of light through the negative and then placed the paper in a developing solution. Soon the face of my mother's family began to appear on the paper. Okay, so which answer provides a detail that best leads in the description that follows? The description that follows sounds like he's describing the Lightroom. And like the process of getting out maybe some family photos or something. So now that we've done all this predicting work, we have earned the right to look at the answers. All right, so which of these is a detail that leads in the description that follows? All right. So no change illuminated only by its dim red safe light. I guess so. It's like a detail, kind of talking about the dark room. That might be good. If I like an answer but I'm not sure, I'm going to put a check mark next to it. Similarly, if I don't like an answer, but I'm not sure, I'll put a minus sign next to it. 
minus signs and check marks. I'm sure when I first taught this, we did minus signs and plus signs, but the minus signs and plus signs started to look too similar. So it's a minus sign and a check mark. We want those two marks to be quite distinct from each other. And once again, the minus sign is to show an answer that you don't like, but you're not sure why. The check mark is to show an answer you do like, but you're not sure why. And you may remember from the previous video on the two-step year, the grammar video, uh, we always want to cross out the part of the answer that makes it wrong. We cross out words and we underline punctuation that make answers wrong. But if we're not sure what makes it wrong, we put the minus sign if we don't like the answer, we put the check mark if we do like the answer. Leaving these little notations next to the answers that clarifies your thinking. And when you come back to the answer 40 seconds later after looking at the other answers, you can remember in an instant how you felt about the answer and why. As opposed to if you don't make a mark or you just cross out the whole thing, when you come back to that answer 40 seconds later, you're not going to remember why you marked it and you have to redo your whole thought process. So a really nice note-taking system of how to mark wrong answers is very helpful to keeping your thinking very clear as you go through the test. So let's look at G here. Located in the art building on the South Campus. I don't think that the rest of this paragraph talked about uh, where we are on campus. So I'm just going to say on the South Campus. I'm crossing that out. That's like giving directions. I don't think that leads into the description that follows. All right, H, which was open for use by photography students. I guess so. I don't know if it's so generally just like here for photography students. It's really more about this particular students' unique experience in that dark room. So I'm still liking F more than H. J, occasionally shared with others from the class. This was just not about sharing the dark room with others from the class, so J is out. So we like F. If you don't go through these steps of predicting, covering the answers, underlining the key phrase, that tells you what the right answer must do. And if the question mentions part of the passage going and summarizing it, like we did with the description that follows in this paragraph. If you don't take those steps, you're liable to slip into an answer that just kind of sounds good. And you'll notice the questions never say, which of these answers sounds the best? It's not it. They're asking for something very specific. Which of the answers provides the detail that best leads into the description that follows in the paragraph? Okay, that's what our right answer must do. So when you cover the answers, underline the key phrase, summarize any part of the passage mentioned in the question, you're just so sharp about exactly what the question wants, and you'll have like zero doubt as to which answer it is. So I hope that makes sense. Real quick, we'll just look at a couple other of these rhetoric, underline the key phrase questions so you can recognize them well. Twelve here is a rhetoric, underline the key phrase question. And it's underline the key phrase because it's actually asking something very unique, and we want to make sure we go underline that part of the question that gets at the uniqueness. So let's see in 12, what's the unique thing they're asking? Which following true statements if added at the beginning of this paragraph would most effectively introduce readers to the information presented in the paragraph? By the way, I didn't do step one, I didn't cover the answers. There we go. Step one, cover the answers. Step two, underline the key phrase. The phrase is in the question. And step three is if the question mentions part of the passage, we got to go summarize it. So this one does mention part of the passage. It mentions the information presented in the paragraph. So we're going to go summarize the information presented in the paragraph. And let's go do that. All right. In one shot, my young grandparents toted crates filled with ripe fruit, and my mother sat on a branch, peering down at the camera. They floated before me, not like ancestral ghosts, but physical and alive. Yet all my mother's stories came to mind. I recalled her description of the long, hard hours spent working in the migrant camps in the peach and apricot fuzz that prickled her skin. Which one most effectively introduces readers to the information presented in the paragraph. So it basically talked about a photograph of the grandmother and how they were... Uh, in the migrant camps with the fruit. So something that's going to introduce us to that. Now we'll check these answers. I like F. Seems, that seems to be what the paragraph is about. The uh, relatives working in the orchards. 
Gee, developing photographs is a difficult process. This is just not about the process of developing photographs. As World War II came to a close, my grandparents worked as migrant laborers. That sounds pretty good. Um, so I like F and H, J. Many people have immigrated to the United States over the years to work as migrant farm laborers. It's not many about many people. It's really about the family. So let's just go back. This is either going to be about relatives working in the California orchards or as, the, as World War II came to a close. My grandparents worked as migrant laborers. Let's go look again. One shot, my grandparents are. Right before me, not like a physical life. And all, all, all my more alleged stories can I recall to description of long I spent working in migrant camps. And my grandfather said they been migrant camps. I'm going with H, that it's really about the migrant camps, so it would be migrant laborers. H would make more sense. Um, Okay, so there you have it. Cover the answers, underline the key phrase. If the question mentions part of the passage, go summarize it. And let me find you some rhetoric questions. 13 does not mention part of the passage. So all you do is cover the answers and underline the key phrase. So for 13 here, given all, all the following choices are true, which one provides information that is most relevant at this point in the essay? All right. So we would have covered the answers. Now underline that key phrase, and then we'll just see which of them provides information most relevant at this point in the essay. It doesn't have a specific part of the passage mentioned that we would have to go summarize as part of the prediction. 15, another rhetoric underline the key phrase question. So the writer's goal had been to write a brief essay on how to, how to develop photographs in a dark room. Okay. So that's all about, like, that's the point of this question. So we're going to underline it, and then we'd say, uh, we predict sort of here, yes or no, and why. And I'd say, no, it's not about that. Uh, it was more about, like, the intimate experience with these particular family photographs about being in the migrant camps. Um, yeah, D. Focuses instead on the personal significance of a set of photographs. So rhetoric, underline the key phrase questions. They're wordy. They're asking something really specific. So your job in predicting on them is to cover the answers, underline the key phrase in question. That tells you exactly what they want. And if the question mentions part of the passage, go summarize it. And then I promise you, you're going to get like every single one of these correct going forward. All right. Thanks a lot. Good luck on these.